And now it's time for the Everlasting Gospel. Welcome to the Everlasting Gospel today. I'm Gary McDade, and I'm the host for the program. We appreciate you being with us. This is the program where we just take a few minutes out of the day and get to study God's Word together. Thank you for your interest in the program. In our study today, we're going to take a look at a topic from the Psalms entitled, This is the Day Which the Lord Hath Made. That comes to us from Psalm 118, verse 24. We want to look at the concept presented here and the surrounding verses in the context of Psalm 18, 24. So let's notice and begin by noticing that in the Psalms, the psalmist declared, this is the day which the Lord hath made. That comes from Psalm 118, 24, and the whole verse says, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The context in which this passage appears, and it's always helpful to study the Bible in its context, or else we may really miss the point of the writing. So in backing up just a little bit from verse 24, I want you to notice that there are messianic prophecies in these verses. Well, what do you mean messianic prophecies? We mean to say that there are verses that foretell details of the coming Christ in these passages, these verses in Psalm 100. 18. Let's notice them. He will mention the stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. You're going to find that fulfillment in places like 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 through 11. Also, as you look down in the passage, you'll see it's this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. You'll see that in verses like the book of Matthew chapter 21, verse 42, and also Ephesians 2 and verse 20. And then as we read a little bit further into verse 26, we find a statement, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And you'll find that repeated in our New Testament in at least three places that I found, Matthew 23, 39, Mark 11, 9, and Luke 13, verse 35. The point of the discussion now is to say that these passages from verse 22 to 26 contain prophecies about the coming Christ. And these prophecies surround the key verse for our study, verse 24. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Therefore, we conclude that the passage that says this is the day which the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it has to do with the coming Messiah and his church or his kingdom. And that's what we like to examine today. We'll be looking at the day the Lord made, and we will find that that day is called the Lord's Day, Revelation 1.10. And we will see the significance of the Lord making this day. Why is it that we have this day? Now, we've studied in the recent past about how there are many people today who emphasize Sabbath day and Sabbath day worship, and an emphasis on the Sabbath day. And we saw how that our friends in the Seventh-day Adventists have peculiar doctrines about the Sabbath day, believing that to be a covenant separate from the Ten Commandments, covenant, and that it is an overarching command from eternity to eternity. And it's all about the Sabbath day. The fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. In Exodus chapter 12, rather 20, down in verse 12. Now notice, they're placing an undue emphasis on the Sabbath day. And you'll hear them talking about the Sabbath day. In previous studies, I noted with you how they mentioned that we are guilty of thinking the Lord changed the Sabbath day from the seventh day to the first day. And I called attention to the fact that I've never believed that in my life, nor do churches of Christ teach that. Because we don't believe the Sabbath day was changed to the first day. It was like being, say, number seven is changed to number one. That doesn't make sense. The Sabbatarians will argue that one of the popes changed the Sabbath to the first day of the week. We don't follow the popes. We're members of the Church of Christ. We follow Jesus Christ, who is the one who's the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews chapter five, verse eight and nine. I called attention to the fact that we get a lot of correspondence when we talk about the Sabbath day from our Seventh-day Adventist friends. And I've enjoyed the many letters that they've sent me over the last few years. I have responded to each one of them individually, either in writing them a letter or talking to them on the phone or both or in person. 
And so we appreciate the correspondence. But I've also noted how that one of the flaws in the reasoning that I see consistent with the material is they will just state, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, and they believe that proves their case, that we're to still be worshiping on the Sabbath day. No, you're going to have to make an argument that ties that Sabbath to the New Testament. You can't make it from the New Testament. It's an Old Testament practice. Well, I wanted to note that with you because while under the Old Testament, there was remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, under the New Testament, you'll find that the Lord receives the focus of attention. The Lord's day, the day the Lord made. Emphasis upon is upon the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done in the New Testament. One of the problems with Seventh-day Adventism is it is named after a movement, Adventism. That is the belief that the second coming of Christ is just around the corner. They predicted that in 1843 it didn't happen, 1844 it didn't happen, 1845 it didn't happen. They called it the great disappointment. Today they believe in talking about the advent of Christ, the second coming of Christ. They believe it's about to happen. So emphasis on a movement instead of the master. We preach Christ and him crucified. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts chapter 4, in verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. We preach Christ, and the emphasis is on Christ. That's why we're members of the Church of Christ. That's why we wear the name Christian. It comes from Christ. Acts eleven twenty six, Acts 26, 28, and 1 Peter 4, 16 are places in our New Testament where Christ is found. So in the Old Testament, there's clearly an emphasis on Sabbath day. That's not carried over into the New Testament, as we're about to see. But rather, the emphasis is on the Lord. The Lord made a day. It was an important day. But that day is not revered above other days. There are things that take place on that day that receive the emphasis. They include the worship of the Lord and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to call attention to this is the day which the Lord hath made. And that's the title of our lesson. Now, let's go to a slide that I have for you if you're able to see this on television. If not, I'll just read it for you. You have the thought among our Seventh-day Adventist friends, nothing would ever pass from the law for any reason. They believe it to be an eternal covenant. They do not believe it could be taken away for any reason. However, in Matthew 5 and verse 18, our Lord said, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The jot or tittle are the diacritical markings in the Hebrew because it has no vowels, only consonants, that allow pronunciation of words to take place. Jots and tittles, little markings. You'll notice not a jot or a tittle would pass away. And then this phrase, till all be fulfilled. An understanding and discerning person will see that the law was going to be taken away, but it wouldn't happen until a certain point. What would that point be? That point would be till it is fulfilled. Now again on the chart I have, we have a number of passages of Scripture listed. For example, we have in Matthew chapter 3, in verse 15, at the baptism of Jesus, he states that he is being baptized to fulfill all righteousness. We see also in Matthew 5 at verse 17, where we just read verse 18 just a second ago. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Christ came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And that's a key idea I'd like to share with my Sabbatarian friends. That is why Christ came, to fulfill the Old Testament law and the prophets. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Ladies and gentlemen, when the law is fulfilled by Jesus Christ, it will pass away. It is interesting that one of the seven statements our Lord makes on Calvary's cross, when he hangs suspended between the twilight of two worlds, shedding his saving blood 
for the remission of our sins, Matthew 26, 28. Hebrews 9 and verse 22. One of the seven statements that he makes recorded in John 19 and verse 30 is, it is finished. A brief statement, yet a powerful and meaningful statement that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. They would stand till they were fulfilled. But now then, it is finished. They have been fulfilled. He fulfilled everything that was written in the law and the prophets concerning him. That will be the theme of many gospel sermons once his church is established. Also on our list, I want to notice with you at this point, while Christ is being crucified on the cross, Colossians 2.14 points back to that time where Paul writes, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that were against us, that were contrary to us, taking them out of the way, nailing them to his cross. That verse tells you that Jesus fulfilled the law and he took the law out of the way. He shed his blood in order to abolish the Old Testament law. There are verses that we've studied recently, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, and 8, for example, and also Ephesians 2, 15. I'm just mentioning them because we won't take the time to study them today since we studied them earlier, that tell us the law has been abolished by the blood and the body of Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm giving you Colossians 2.14 to show you it was the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us. The law, you'll recall, was written with the finger of God, Exodus 31 in verse 18. And what happened? Those laws were blotted out, taken away at the cross. So the allegation that we receive often that we believe the Sabbath was changed from the seventh day to the first is totally false. We don't believe it, and I've given you the reason. Because the Sabbath law was abolished at the cross. And now we're looking for the Lord to make another day. What is that day? This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We'd like to explore that a little further but just in just a minute. But notice first, in Romans chapter 7, verse 4, Paul writes more about the Old Testament law passing away. Notice, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him that is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. See, we can't be married to the law and married to Christ at the same time. That's why what I'm saying, I'm hopeful, is instructional to our Seventh-day Adventist friends. You can't be wedded to the law and its teaching, including the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, and be married to Christ. It is spiritual adultery to think so. We want to see that and present that in the clearest terms. Also in the next chapter, in Romans 8 and verse 2, Paul writes, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Ladies and gentlemen, we're made free from the old law by the new law of Jesus Christ. That's really important to notice. Further, here's another thought I'd like to give you. It is from Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39. In Paul's first recorded sermon, Paul said, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, he's speaking of Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. So now we understand why. We can't be justified from our sins by the law of Moses. It takes the law of Christ for that to happen. We turn over further in our New Testament to delve into that just a little more, and we hope it will bring you great spiritual profit to know that, great spiritual benefit to know that. The verse is Hebrews 9 and verse 15. Here again Paul writes, And for this cause... He is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Yes, Christ died for the sins under the First Testament, but what did he do? He mediated or brought about 
the New Testament. Concerning this New Testament, he says in Matthew 26, 28, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Christ is the giver of the New Testament. The old law has been abolished as law. Now, friends, it still serves for our learning. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. It's like our schoolmaster to teach us about the coming Christ. After all, it contains over 600 prophecies, like the two or three we're reading in Psalm 118, verse 22 to 26. And it's our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, Galatians 3, 24. But it's not our law. The New Testament is our law. Let me say it this way for emphasis. If there's anyone living today who will be blessed by the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross, including the forgiveness of his and her sins, it will come to them by means of the New Testament of Jesus Christ. No other means under heaven can save us from sin than the New Testament that Jesus Christ made sure that we had, and we have it in its entirety and its completeness from Matthew to Revelation. So I just want to make that point with you about how privileged we are. Now let me follow that up and close this out with one verse from the next chapter in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 9. I know it is hard, and this is why I'm trying to be so delicate here. I know it is hard for our Seventh-day Adventist friends to conceive that we're not under that Old Testament law and the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And so I want you to see one last effort here from Hebrews 10, 9 to see that we're not under that Testament, we're under the New Testament. We can't be under two covenants at once. We are under the New Covenant. Here's what Paul wrote. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He, Jesus Christ, taketh away the first, the Old Testament, that he may establish the second, the New Testament. Now there you have it. If you'd like to write me about that, I'd love to hear your correspondence on that. I want you to be able to see what the Bible teaches about the abolishing of the Old Testament law. Ephesians 2.15 will be one verse to point out. Now, it won't do any good to write about passages in the Old Testament under the lawgiver Moses and say God gave the law through Moses and say that a number of times and write a sheet full of scriptures on that saying that as is often the case that I receive. We already know that was the law of Moses and it was given by God to Israel, Deuteronomy 5.3. Today, the Lord has given us the New Testament. And verses you need to comment on are Ephesians 2.15 and Hebrews 10.9. That's a good summary passage for all of the verses that were studied earlier. All right, with that in mind, let's delve a little further into this day. I'd like to give you now four reasons for affirming this day spoken of in prophecy in the Old Testament, finding its fulfillment in the New Testament to be the first day of the week. Four reasons why the day being referenced there are referenced to the first day of the week. Now, like I've already told you, I believe we have an anticipation of this pointing to the New Testament and to something that the Messiah was going to do, things that would be associated with him because of the Messianic prophecies surrounding verse 24. Remember, we started in verse 22, read 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26, and noted with amazement the prophetic statements about Christ and saw in the New Testament, and I gave you a list of verses where those passages are fulfilled, not in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. So we already, we're already anticipating the idea that there are four reasons why the day the Lord has made points over to the New Testament and away from the Old Testament. The first of these reasons is the Lord was resurrected upon the first day of the week. Now in Mark, rather in Luke and in John, you'll notice that the writers simply say, the first day of the week. And it is the first day of the week and the events of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ are written by inspiration following that statement. However, in Matthew and in Mark, it's put a little differently. It is said there, when it was the end of the Sabbath and then the events which follow. So there cannot be any way, and I've spoken to some Seventh-day Adventist people, 
who like to let that bleed over into the first day of the week and have it be the Sabbath. You can't do it. The Sabbath ends. The Sabbath has ended is the way they put it. Then it's the next day, which is the first day of the week. So you'll have the first day of the week is the day the Lord was raised from the dead. This is the day that the Lord has made. Now notice in Romans 1 with me in verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Let me ask you, how is Jesus declared to be the Son of God with power? It is by his resurrection from the dead. Now, which day of the week did that occur on? The first day of the week. That is why the day of Psalm 1824 is a reference not to the seventh day, but to the first day of the week. It's the day the Lord made for Christ to be raised, resurrected upon, as we've seen in the various verses from the gospel accounts. Well, a second reason. I'd like to get all four of these in before we run out of time. The Lord's church was established upon the first day of the week. Well, how do we know that? Because we read in Acts 2 verse 1, now, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, what day is it? The day of Pentecost. Can we know what day of the week that was? Yes, we can. How do we know? Because the day of Pentecost always fell on the same day of the week. And what day of the week was that? We go for that definition to Leviticus 23, verse 15 and 16. And in that passage of Scripture, what we learn is how to identify the day of Pentecost. It would be Pentecost, 50th day. You start with the Sabbath and you number seven Sabbaths. They are to be complete. That gives you 49 days. The day of Pentecost was always the day after the seventh Sabbath. That would be a first day of the week. Didn't matter when that fell, you're numbering seven Sabbaths. The, day of, the first day is always going to follow a Sabbath. In regard to that, you're numbering seven. The next one, First day of the week, ladies and gentlemen, the Church of Christ was established upon the first day of the week, Acts 2, verse 1. You know that because by the time you read Peter's sermon and the response to it, you come to the end of the chapter and Luke, the inspired writer, says, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved or those that were being saved. The church of Christ was established or built upon the first day of the week. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This day was anticipated in the recesses of the Old Testament in 2 Samuel 7, 12 and following, and many other verses, when the church would be established and built by our Lord. And he does that building on the first day of the week, even in his personal ministry. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. In Matthew 16, in verse 18. So that's one reason we know that this day refers to the first day of the week. A third reason, the Lord's church met for worship upon the first day of the week. Three verses I'd like to share with you here. One from Acts 2.42. This one because we've already established we know the day this is taking place. Guess what day it is? First day of the week. It's a Pentecost. It was always the first day of the week. What did they do that day? They worshiped. How do you know? Verse 42 of Acts 2 tells us that they worshiped. Luke writes, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's teaching and preaching. And fellowship. That's the communion one with another, as is engaged in in corporate worship called singing, Ephesians 5.19. And in breaking of bread. That's the Lord's Supper. And in prayers. We didn't leave out the contribution. That comes from fellowship joint participation and sharing. This worship takes place on the first day of the week. Now, this passage will prove that, but also there are two others. And I have been surprised about one thing in talking to Seventh-day Adventist friends, and that is they seem unaware that early Christians met on the first day of the week. And when I read the next two verses, they tend to be a little bit silent. The next verse I want to share with you is Acts 20 and verse 7, which says, Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech unto midnight. What were they doing? Taking the Lord's Supper, breaking bread. Paul was preaching. Items of worship that indicate they worshiped 
And the day of the week is noted. Why? Because this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It is indisputable and undeniable that the early church met for worship upon the first day of the week. That is not to say they did not meet on other days of the week. That is to say that they did meet upon the first day of the week. And that's the day that is being brought into question by our Seventh-day Adventist friends. A next passage, a third one to give you, is 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Paul writes of this Christian practice. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, that every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. On the first day of the week, the collection is to be taken up. Now, this one really causes the crowd to quiet down when you're talking about it among Seventh-day Adventists because they don't meet on the first day of the week for worship. They meet on the seventh day. This is the day, the first day of the week. What do they say about it, you may wonder? Well, in some of the materials that I got from them, and I have some of these on the desk, among them I received this book right here. There is no author to the book. It's written by Harvesting Books. It's a publication of Seventh-day Adventists. In here, you know what they say about this passage to try to dismiss it? I can tell you why there's no author given. We don't know who wrote this. I was handed this by a Seventh-day Adventist. That's why I know it's a Seventh-day Adventist book. I was given it by them. The lady said, will you read this book? And I said, I sure will if you'll do something for me. She said, what? I said, if you'll read Deuteronomy 5.3, I'll read all, I think it's 112 pages. I'll read all this book. If you'll read Deuteronomy 5.3. She said, I love Deuteronomy. Seventh-day Adventists love Deuteronomy. I said, wonderful. Read that passage and think it over. It says, the Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us who are here alive this day. Their view is he did make it with the fathers. That shows you the basis upon which Seventh-day Adventists rest is flawed. Now watch this. Here's the way they explain away 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. The writer of this little booklet says, the eighth and last Sunday text in the Bible is found in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, where Paul instructs the believers to do their bookkeeping at home on Sunday morning. Is that what he said? As I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. Do your bookkeeping at home on Saturday morning. He said, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by and store as God prospered him. It's a shame, ladies and gentlemen, that people who say they believe in the Bible would treat it in any such a way as this. I can see why the person who wrote that would be ashamed to have his or her name connected with such as that. It's blasphemous teaching. Let's get the last one in. It is, we believe that the day is the first day of the week because the Apostle John was in the Spirit a necessary spiritual attitude for worship. John 4, 24, upon the first day of the week. Revelation 1 in verse 10. Well, thank you for being with us for our study today. I hope it's been helpful. We've not taught enough about the proper day of worship for these items discussed. And I hope this discussion will prove helpful. Please return to the Everlasting Gospel.